verses 1 through 17 in just a moment. But we are concluding our series this morning entitled, If My People, A Call to Prayer. And we've been looking at instances and times when God's people prayed and what we can learn from it and glean from it. And this morning we're going to wrap up our series by looking at the early church and you know there there are some issues that have taken place we we looked at uh last week that you know there was a, a, a one of the apostles wasn't the apostle anymore because of judas right and and what they needed to do and they, it was the very first prayer meeting but the problems would arise in the church and situations would come in the church and one of the things that we see throughout the early church is that when these challenges presented themselves they prayed and so we're looking at another one uh this morning so if you if you found it by now it's acts chapter 12 verse 1 through 17 and it says this about that time herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church he killed james the brother of john with the sword and when he saw that it pleased the jews he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains and sentries, before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them in it, on its own accord, and they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported the, that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the, bro and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks this morning? Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, God, for this powerful, powerful example given to us of what happens when people pray. Lord, when we put our faith and trust in you, that, Lord, prison gates are open, chains are fallen off, and freedom is given. We thank you, God, for the miraculous. We thank you for the supernatural. We thank you, God, that these things bring awe and wonder to us. But, Lord, this is, these are the acts that you do as easy and as common for as if we're breathing. We thank you, God, for that. Speak to us through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God answers prayer in marvelous ways, right? Understand this. He answers prayer in marvelous ways. And I think sometimes we don't fully appreciate even a simple answer to our prayers and really the, the power behind that. I think sometimes as people, we, we, we get used to stuff so much that we lose the awe and the wonder. I read a devotional this past week, and the, the writer was talking about Job was giving thanks to God for rain. And he thought, that's kind of an odd thing to give God thanks for rain. And then he got to thinking about it a little bit more and realized that in a dry and arid place, rain is very valuable. Um, and where that rain was coming from, and he begins to get into this 
big scientific thing about how the water uh, in the Mediterranean Sea evaporates, becomes little vapors of gas and goes up into the heavens. And there it collects and and it can't be too heavy because then it would fall. And and just the, the, the wonder and the awe. And I got to thinking, oh, my goodness. And I always find it a nuisance when it rains. I didn't realize the miracle behind it and the science behind it and how God orchestrates all of that. And I think we as humans get to the point where God answers a prayer and we're just, oh, great. And then we just go on our way as if nothing happened. And God help us that we would stop in our tracks and give him praise for every prayer that we offer that he answers. And he does answer all of our prayers. Sometimes it's a yes, sometimes it's a no, sometimes it's wait, and sometimes it's not right now. And he answers our prayers. It's not necessarily how we like it or when we want it, but he does answer our prayers. And that we are in awe and holy fear that when we pray, God is listening and he answers our prayers in marvelous ways. Now, the book of Acts is the history of the early church. And one thing that happened frequently in the first church was waves of persecution and violence that would would overtake it. And and in the beginning, it started out with the Sanhedrin and and uh, and then it went and it increased to not just local municipalities, but then the whole Roman Empire was against the church and and how the church handled this is amazing. And I think it's something that we can glean to from today. Acts chapter 12 records one of those waves of persecution. James is killed in verse two. Um, this is this is a powerful persecution that's facing the church in the past. It was the Sanhedrin that would threaten them. They would be beaten. Not that anybody would want to be beaten. But, you know, that was that was the, the only thing that they had to fear. Maybe possessions taken away. But now we see that it has increased and it has escalated. And now one of the twelve, one of the apostles has been martyred for the faith. Now, we know Stephen. Right. But this is now James. And so uh, it, it has increased. And not only had they killed James, but now Peter is arrested in verse two with the intent of doing to him what was done to James. As a result of Peter going to prison, the church felt a response was required. Right. Rightfully so. And what was their response? Did they storm the courthouse? No. Did they petition the government? No. Are those things, I mean, is petitioning the government bad? No. But that's not what their first reaction was. Did they get on social media and get, you know, a, get, they get, call the media to, to, to broadcast this injustice? Did they schedule riots and marches and petitions and all? No. What, did, what was their first response? Prayer. Not that petitioning our government and those things, lawful things, aren't wrong, but that wasn't their first response. And I wonder for us, if we were facing what the early church faced, let's say the local government in town or, or even the state government or the federal government comes in on a Sunday morning, arrests us all, and begins killing us for our faith, what would be our first response? I think that's telling. It's telling because it tells us where our faith is. If our first response is something that I can do, then my faith is in me. But if my first response is in petitioning God, then it shows that my faith is in God and not in me. This new persecution was much different, like I said. It wasn't just a beating. It wasn't just idle threats. Now there was a leader of the church murdered. Initially, the persecution was from the Sanhedrin, but now it's Herod. And we will soon see in church history that it grew to the Roman Empire. And even the empire was hunting down Christians and filling the Colosseums with Christians and sending them to their death. Now we see Herod. He's a representative of the state, endeavored to destroy the church, not just from getting the, 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 the common people, but attacking the leadership. He is the grandson of Herod the Great, and his persecution of the church would have been viewed as a diplomatic 
uh, recourse. And we see that in the text that he saw that it pleased the Jews. And so that bolstered his claim to the throne and it bolstered his relationship, his dip diplomatic relationships with the Sanhedrin. Additionally, Josephus claims that Herod Agrippa desired to be thought as a devout Jew and so would be eager to persecute the Christians uh, because it would have pleased them and he would have won favors with them and it would have ensured that they had or was given him their, their friendship and he would have the leadership of the Jewish people behind him. So this first thing that we see in our text this morning of this great situation that was affecting the church is the helplessness of the situation. I think sometimes people think that when we pray, if prayer is our first go to or plan A, that it's a denial of reality. When we pray, we don't have to deny the situation that we're in. That's not faith. All right. That's delusional. Right. If you are in a difficult situation, there is nothing that's wrong with going before the Lord and declaring to him the situation. That's what we see throughout Scripture when God's people pray. It wasn't like they they kind of glossed it over and minimized the, the problem. They were honest and they were open before God. And we see that with the early church, the helplessness of the situation. And as they made prayer their first reaction of what they were facing, they were real with the situation that they were going in. James had been murdered. Peter is in prison and waiting uh, till Passover is over because that's what they're going to do to him. So the, the situation seemed helpless. What was this small band of Christians within the Jewish religion being occupied by the Roman Empire going to be able to do to rectify this situation? It can seem like they had no hope. The church was reeling by the suddenness and the vigor of this persecution. In a lot of ways, they must have felt helpless. They didn't have a representative government like we do, where we could petition our government and, and we could have some type of recourse against injustice that's taking place. They didn't have that. James is now dead and Peter's in prison. These are the pillars of the church. These are the leadership of the church. This is still a young movement. What were they going to do? Who would be next? I would imagine some of the other apostles, some of the other leadership was looking around and saying, OK, here's the pecking order. Where do I fit in after Peter's gone? Right. And not only that, but who's going to assume the role of those who have gone on? Right. I mean, when you take out leadership in any organization, you have to fill that or everything crumbles. So it's not just who's going to fill it. But if I fill it, am I going to be the next one on their list? Not only who would be next, but what would be next? I would imagine it would be much similar to how we felt on 9-11. Remember that morning when the planes went into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon there was a fear of what next, right? And then you hear in Pennsylvania that, that heroics of those that were on board that uh, drove that plane in the ground rather than allowing it to be used as a missile in another complex. But throughout that day and the next weeks after, it just felt like what else is going to happen? We, everybody was on edge. I would think that this would be similar to what the early church was feeling. James is captured. James is dead. Peter's captured. That's what they're going to do to him. What's going to happen next? Are they going to round us all up? Are they going to kill us all? Because that's not out of the realm of possibilities. They were powerless to open the prison bars and to free Peter. They had no clout, no connections, no influence. They couldn't do anything in the physical realm to help Peter out. He was sunk. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever been in a situation where you feel completely, utterly helpless to do anything in that situation? Maybe you got a report from the doctor that you didn't want to hear and they didn't give you much hope. Or you know of somebody in that same situation and you just feel so helpless. The situation seems too big and you don't feel like you could even muster enough prayer and faith 
to even shake the door, let alone open the prison door. We feel like the Israelites, and I would imagine that the early church felt this way. Remember the Israelites? God had miraculously opened up the way for them to leave Egypt. And right before them was the Red Sea. And as they turned around, there was Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit. I mean, they were literally in that proverbial rock in a hard place situation. If we go into the sea, we're going to drown. If we go back, we're going to be killed. No matter where we go, it's going to be the wrong decision. Have you ever felt that? No matter what you decide, if I decide A, that's the wrong thing. If I decide B, that's the wrong thing. That's a horrible place to be. And that's where the early church is like, what do we do? How do we respond? We feel helpless. We feel overwhelmed. At times in our lives, we are compelled to feel that we can't do anything. Nothing that we can do would matter. Nothing that we could do would work. What can this small sect of followers of the Nazarene do? Not only was the Sanhedrin against them, but now the government is becoming hostile against them and is now rounding them up. The next thing that we discover in our text is what the church did. They prayed. Verse 5 says that while Peter was in prison, it says that the church, but they earnestly prayed for him and was made to God by the church. We see that they earnestly prayed to God for him. They interceded. This wasn't a lay me down to sleep, God bless the meal before I eat it type of prayer. This was a prayer much like their ancestor Jacob before he was called Israel who wrestled with the angel of the Lord and says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. If you read that account, they wrestled all night. And it wasn't until daybreak and the angel realized, hey, I can't defeat them. So he knocked his hip out of joint. And that was the only way that Jacob would let go. I don't know what kind of wrestling match this was, but I've had brothers and I've wrestled. And you have brothers and you wrestle. Even if you're not trying to hurt each other, you get hurt. I mean, an elbow goes here, your ear gets pulled here. And, and if you're getting pinned, you know, you kind of start to get a little fearful because, you know, you, you can't breathe. And so instinct takes over, survival takes over. You just, I mean, this is what was happening all night. And it's a picture of how we ought to pray that we don't let go. The early church prayed in such a way, much like their ancestor who wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And they earnestly prayed. There's an easy self-evaluation for us as believers in this verse. And I mentioned it earlier. When the government or some authority comes against us, whether small or large, and they become hostile against us, how do we respond? You see, the early church responded immediately with prayer. They didn't take political action. They didn't boycott. They didn't post on social media. They didn't try to, to get all the attention to garner to, to try to work it out in their mindset because that's what we tend to do. We try to look at situations and problems and we look at it through our human intellect and say, okay, this is how I've got to figure this out. And what God is calling us to do is to set that aside and to get the mind of Christ first. Because sometimes... What we think God ought to do in a situation isn't what he wants to do in a situation. And we can find ourselves praying against the very will of God that he wants to do. And we could be finding ourselves praying that God do this, do this. And then we get frustrated because he's not answering. And it's all because we don't have the mind of Christ before and understanding that maybe this is how he wants to answer the prayer request. The Greek word for earnest means stretched out as if something is being covered or without ceasing. And I love that because the church literally was covering Peter's imprisonment with prayer and they were doing so continually. Late in the night, they were still wrestling with God, still covering Peter with prayer because that was all they could do. Maybe that's the secret sauce is figuring out. I may have the resources and I may have the ability, but maybe I should set all that aside and get with God and allow him to work and to demonstrate his power rather than me trying to figure it out. And that's what the early church did. You see, when we feel that we're helpless 
And that there's nothing we can do. Understand this. There is something so much greater that you can do that money can't buy. That no matter how much intellect or uh, planning you have can't do. And that is prayer. Prayer is not just plan B. It is not our last resort. It's not something that's reserved. It's like our ace in the, you know, up our sleeve that, you know, when I played all that I can play, I got that right. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is the best course of action. The first course of action every time. Oswald Chambers asserts this, and it's such a powerful quote. Prayer does not fit us for greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Do you get that? Prayer does not fit you for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Oftentimes we look at prayer that fits us for the greater work. To answer that prayer, to, 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 to intervene in that situation. But it's the process of prayer is the greater work. Because in the process of prayer, we are conformed to the image of Christ. And we become one with Christ. And he gives us his mindset and his perspective on a situation That we wouldn't have had else. Prayer must be our plan A. Leonard Ravenhill admonishes. Quit playing. Start praying. Quit feasting. Start fasting. Talk less with men. Talk more with God. Listen less to men. Listen to the words of God. Skip travel. Start travail. But see it's easier to talk to men than it is to God. It's easier to listen to others than it is to listen to God. It's much more easier and better to our bodies to feast than to fast. Prayer must be the first thing, the second thing, the third thing that we do as Christians and as the church. When we pray, it is important that we realize fully that our God can and does control all circumstances. You see, this is the the powerful truth that we can come into prayer knowing that his ear is attentive to our cry and that he is all powerful and that there is nothing too difficult for him. Jeremiah 3, 32, 27 says this, and God is asking, and it's a facetious question. He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? God is asking his people, is there anything too difficult for me? Sometimes we say, yes, Lord, there is. But not if we spend time in prayer first. Even if we enter into a difficult situation, an impossible situation, through prayer, our perspective changes and we are able to answer this prayer. No, Lord, there's nothing too difficult for you. This portion of scripture Helped me during a difficult time in my life when I was young. I was in love with Mandy. She wasn't my wife then, but I was in love with her. And I asked her mom if I could court her, date her, with the intense purpose of one day marrying her. I was nervous. Any fellas in the place, you know what I'm feeling, right? And her mom would leave as soon as church was out so it wasn't like you know so i had to plan this strategically and say okay as soon as they say amen she's out i gotta be out there as i said do you have like five minutes i'm like trying to breathe you know and talk and i just asked i said can i date mandy and i'm thinking she's gonna say yes she did it She goes, I don't know. Let me pray about it. What? That wasn't what I was thinking, right? So for a whole week, it was the longest week of my life. I prayed. I prayed like I never prayed before because if she said no, it's over before it even began. But I prayed and I prayed and the Lord brought me to this verse. Because here I'm thinking, there's no way that she would say yes. Her dad doesn't even want to talk to me, doesn't even want to be friendly to me. I found out later that it was only after I married Mandy that he did like me. But, you know, it was a Spanish thing that, hey, you don't talk to the you don't like the guy until he marries your daughter. And then some weird thing like that. But but I didn't know that at the time. And so I prayed and God brought me to this verse. And I sat there and said, no, Lord, there's nothing too difficult for you. 
you can move upon Flora and Armando's heart and you can give them permission for me to date their daughter. A week later, she's a woman of very few words. She comes up and she goes, yes. That was it. That's all I needed to hear. But what sustained me was I knew that God could move. And you know what? When God answers a prayer in your life at one moment, he uses that for the rest of your life to draw you back. Because there have been other impossible moments in my life that I say, oh God, I don't know if you can do this. And he keeps bringing me back. Behold, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? I moved upon your future in-laws' hearts to get you the woman of your dreams. Can I not do this? And I did this. Can I not do this? See, we can look back and have faith in God because of what he did for us in the past. And he's faithful for us in the past. He will be faithful for us in the future because he answered in the past. I know that he hears now and I know that he will answer now. And just because he answered things that were difficult in the past doesn't mean I should fear that he won't do it now. In fact, it should be the opposite. He's batting a thousand. Why do we doubt him? Right? We put more faith in the stock market than we do in God. And that's that's crazy. We put more faith in sports athletes and we have their stats. And, you know, when they get up to the plate, they you know, they're going to strike out 300 times out of a thousand or 400 times out of a thousand. Some even 500 times out of a thousand. We think, man, that's great. God never strikes out. And yet we fear that for some reason, when he steps up to the plate in this situation, he's going to strike out, even though he's never struck out before in the past. So the church prayed. Now, what I love about how God works, and we see this in the final thing that we see in our text, is the result of the prayer. God doesn't always answer the prayers the way we want and how we want or when we want. But he always answers, whether it's a yes or a no or a maybe or not right now or wait or he always answers our prayers. But what I love about God is that even when we come before him, he receives us in grace because even when we pray fervently and earnestly and we're wrestling with the angel of the Lord, as the early church did, there may be a little bit of doubt intertwined in there. And that's okay. God is big enough for our little doubts. We see this right in the text. Verse 6 through 12 tells the story of how the church's prayer was answered. When the people pray, we see that the angel of the Lord was dispatched and he rescues Peter. Uh, This angelic being escorts Peter right out of jail. Uh, Such an unbelievable course of events that it takes a while for Peter to even realize that it's real. He thought he was dreaming, thought it was a vision. He was so sound asleep. Did you catch that when we read it earlier that he hits him in the side to wake him up? I mean, the next day he's supposed to die and Peter is sound asleep. He has to be shaken and then the angel has to tell him every little thing to do. Okay, Peter, get your clothes on. All right, get your shoes on. Like you would think that if I, I, I believe me, if I was in prison and this happened, you wouldn't have to tell me twice. I'm already out the door before you're even opening up the door. OK, but no, Peter is just oh, what? Get dressed, get your shoes on. Let's go. Kind of leading them along. God responds to faith. Peter had such peace that he was literally so fast asleep that the, phys- that the angel had to physically awaken him. That peace is only afforded to those who have completely put their, hand, their life in the hands of God through prayer. What happens next in verses 13 and 17 is encouraging because sometimes it's hard to believe prayers are answered. And I love that the, that the, the book of Acts shows the church not as this perfect group of being, a gathered people of God, but he, they show all their flaws too. Peter goes, knocks at the gate. Servant girl, Rhoda sees. Oh, that's Peter. Gets so excited. Could you, I mean, imagine this as a movie, right? Knocks on the gate. I mean, this dramatic, marvelous answer to prayer. And there it is, knocking on the gate. And the girl gets so excited. Ah! And she just runs inside and leaves him out there. Like, hello, 
Do you not realize that if the authorities get wind that he's not in prison, that they're probably looking for him and maybe even so are looking for him and you're leaving him out there and yet you're praying that you, he would be delivered and you get so excited and you go and you tell everybody and they don't even believe you. No, that can't be. I want to know what the early church was praying for. Peter's release. The girl's saying, hey, he's out there. No, it's just his angel. What? All the while, Peter keeps knocking on the door. Aren't you glad that God still answers our prayers even when we sometimes don't believe that God will answer our prayers or maybe he answers our prayers in ways that we don't think? I don't know what they were thinking or what they, how they were in their mind. Obviously, it wasn't how God answered their prayers because they couldn't believe it when Peter was knocking outside the gate. Have you ever been there? You prayed and God marvelously answered and you were completely shocked. You were just like, what? And it was like, well, you were praying that and God answered. But maybe you felt that. I know there have been times in my life where I prayed and God answered and I was just dumbfounded and astonished. And the Holy Spirit is like, but you prayed. Why would you be surprised? I love the early church gives us such a great ex example. As we close, we, we learn something powerful. We learn that although we pray and although God answers prayer, that doesn't mean that we're given a life of ease and comfort. We see that through the early church. A faithful life doesn't mean an easy life, as Peter and the first church understood but a faithful life does mean that we that when we pray, amazing things can and do happen. And maybe that's why we struggle in prayer, because we equate God answering our prayers with a life of ease and comfort. And it isn't that way. Oftentimes, a faithful life is a difficult life that God has called us to. And in the process of that difficult life. And being faithful, God shows his glory and his grace in our midst. And he does great and glorious things, not so that we take the credit, but that he would take the credit so that others would see and realize that what took place in our text this morning wasn't because the church was this strong political action committee group of people. It wasn't that they had this great clout and influence. It wasn't anything in them that brought this miracle it was the god that they served much like paul who prayed three times that this thorn in his flesh would be taken and each time jesus said my grace is sufficient because it's in your weakness that i am made strong as you have this physical ailment and you put your hands on somebody who is sick and they're healed they recognize that the healing power didn't come from you but it came from god and I think sometimes that's why we go through what we go through and why we must spend our time in prayer so that the glory of God can work through us so that the world around us would be in amazement that it didn't come from our wisdom or our strength or our influence or our power and might, but it came through the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you join me in praying? Father, we thank you for this series as we wrap it up. Lord, I pray that you would ignite within each one of us a greater desire to pray. The Lord, it would be our go-to. Before we do anything, before we say anything, before we respond or act in any way, may prayer always be the first go-to. So that first and foremost, we would develop the mind of Christ. Be giving your perspective on the situation. So that wisdom may be granted and provision may be given and direction. God, we pray. Birth in us a desire to pray. May we see through the eyes of faith that, Lord, when we, when we subject ourselves under your authority and we humble ourselves and we pray, that, Lord, it opens up the windows of opportunity that would never have been open had we not first humbled ourselves before you. That, God, you would fill us with your glory and that through us and through your church, you would demonstrate your power to the world around us. 
God, we pray that we would be a powerful church because we're a praying church. May we be powerful believers in Christ because we are praying believers in Christ. Father, we pray, call us to the prayer closet. Burden our hearts and speak to us in those moments. In Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.